Uh, thank you, Finbar, and uh, uh, thank you to the Miguel uh, Summer School for inviting me and inviting me back as I was here uh, two years ago. Uh, it hardly, hardly seems like the same world. Uh, the reasons for economic uh, collapse have been well discussed, uh, and I've heard part of that over, uh, since yesterday. Um, as to fixing it, uh, I would say that it is not just a case of fixing it. I think it is a case of redesigning and recreating this country of ours. I think that's the challenge ahead. And in the process, uh, I would say that we will have to think the unthinkable. Imagine what was not imagined before and try the untried. Uh, and if we are smart, we will, we will build on the good things and good things have happened in this country over the last uh, 20 years, but we will abandon those that have brought us collapse. And as many of the stalwart policies and visible edifices of the Celtic Tiger have collapsed uh, in the last year, education stands out as one pillar whose importance is greater now than ever before and from which people rightly have great expectations. And I believe that our education sector must uh, step up to the plate in new ways and it must lead the way to a stronger, more creative Ireland in many respects. This is a wonderful challenge, but I think it is a real challenge. And today I would like to talk about higher education, and I'll talk about the university uh, in particular. There are two challenges for us. The first one you've, is the same challenge for everybody, and that is survival in the short term. And survival with less resources, less public resources, while keeping intact the achievements of the last decade. Now, this is the short-term uh, solution, and I think that probably the focus of many of the discussions uh, so far this week has been on exactly that uh, short-term. Um, the second challenge, I think, is more important, and so one I want to uh, deal with uh, today, uh, and that is how the university and higher education can help rebuild the economy, but not just the economy, society as well, by innovative and accelerated actions, building on the strengths already in place, but taking inspiration from well-established core values. Finbar referred to that in his introduction, and I firmly support that. I'm not going to talk about funding uh, today. I talked about that uh, two years ago. Um, Brian uh, did talk about that. Um, as regards uh, students making a contribution, I fully support that. And I think uh, students who do make a contribution do make their own demands on the system and do provide quality assurance by virtue of that. I agree with Brian that we all need to up our game. Uh, the game is international, certainly for, for the universities, uh, and we have to compete with them. Uh, as regards uh, duplication uh, of courses and so on, that is quite a complex issue. But I have one example where that has been addressed, and I'll talk about that. Uh, in a moment. So I want to talk about innovation. Now, I'm, I am confident that the universities uh, will deliver uh, in, for the needs of this country based on what they and the other third level institutions have already achieved. Think about almost 60% participation in higher education, as Brian mentioned, compared with 20% 20, 20 in, in around 1980 delivering special skills for industry and health since the 1980s, building research capacity in the last 10 years, which is of international standing, and with a view to creating and commercializing new knowledge, as well as having an impact on teaching quality. And finally, I would like to mention, because most people are concerned about it, the development of strong accountability procedures and management of resources. We have to be accountable. We have to manage our resources more carefully probably, probably than ever before. Now, in stating that um, a university must be innovative and imaginative in responding to the national need, I would say that this is in line with one of the age-old values of the university, the inculcation of critical thinking by challenging accepted notions and coming up with alternatives. In other words, thinking what was unthinkable before imagining the unimagined, and taking risk. I think it is right that the university should be taking perhaps a greater risk, at least intellectually, compared to any other organ 
of the state. So in the next few minutes, I would like to give a few examples of what I see as true innovation and use them as indicators for how we might plan and accelerate innovation across the whole system. Now, all my examples are unashamedly connected with Trinity. So uh, <laughs> I, make, um, I do that because I know them best, but actually every other institution will have their own examples as well. So these are just examples. Um, now, I would be arguing that the mission of the university in the Ireland of the 21st century is threefold. It's about teaching, research, and knowledge transfer, including commercialization and employment creation. Now, everyone accepts the first. Everyone accepts that teaching is central. Most countries place high value on the second, on research, even if doubt has been cast upon it by on board SNP. And the third, uh, knowledge transfer, I would say is probably least appreciated by the general public, even though it is a powerful, a powerful force. Um, and I'll, I will also argue that the university is a community. It's not a business. It's not a business of employees and customers. It is a community which everyone, students and staff alike, are always exploring, always learning and challenging, and in which there is a freedom conducive to spontaneous and unconventional thinking. If the universities cannot cater to that, what, who can? Now, I, I'll start with, I have a few examples uh, and I, I want to talk to you about, and I will draw some conclusions from that. Now, the first relates to an announcement last March by Trinity and UCD uh, in response to the government's smart economy policy. Uh, we took this unprecedented and radical step of joining forces to accelerate the creation of innovative new businesses, businesses and jobs over a 10-year period. Now, we did this conscious that perhaps some of our predecessors might be turning over in their graves, but also conscious that a new approach to the creation of high-quality jobs from excellent research, which is going on, and by skilled graduates was exactly what the country needed. And we were also mindful that together our universities account for almost about 50% of research-related investment in higher education. So we felt a particular responsibility uh, in that regard. And from an international perspective, because we deal on the international stage for this country, we felt that only by combining our resources in both teaching and, uh, and research that would uh, allow us to compete with other countries who are also seeking new ways this very moment to meet their challenges. So this is a moving target. Now, knowledge transfer is what I want to talk about. Uh, is as much about people as it is about managing the intellectual property that arises from research. And we plan to transform both. These are two institutions working together, pooling our resources. We're not merging, by the way, we're collaborating. Uh, currently, we are graduating about 500 master's PhD students every year and we plan to double that. Now, I would say that this can only be justified if we transform the whole experience of those students so that on graduation, they are not just at the cutting edge of knowledge, and of course they should be, but they also have acquired the skills that would enable them to be entrepreneurs and creators of jobs, not just job seekers and not just passive employees. We want to convert uh, through education and by special experience our higher graduates into creators who will, who, will, who will be the people who will make the future rather than waiting for somebody, that, somebody else to offer them jobs. And our plan is to join forces in the inculcation of those skills by using expertise from across the world we don't necessarily have the expertise to, to create this uh, new approach, uh, new um, uh, spirit in our graduates, but there are people across, there are friends across the world that will help us uh, do that. Um, and with this in place, I would say that our master's PhD students will constitute a whole new engine 
for innovation and job creation in this country, an engine that this country has not seen before. That is really new. And in that context, I, I think it makes sense to increase that number because it will have major impact. The second action, uh, joint action, is about getting <clears throat> much greater <clears throat> value from intellectual property, from research. Research produces knowledge. Some of that is, is, is of value commercially. It is of value uh, uh, culturally. It's of value in, in regards to policy. Ireland is doing well in, in this regard, and I would say it's comparable to, for instance, MIT. Everybody looks to MIT as the great driver, the great engine for innovation, job creation, and so on, um, in terms of spin-offs, patents, and so on, per unit of investment. Ireland is doing well in, in that regard. But I think together we can do more. We could triple the number of spin-off companies from our two institutions. We could help more indigenous industry to be more competitive. And we could help anchor international industry in this country like Intel. And I know that was discussed last night. And I would say that we will anchor international investment in Ireland in the future only if there is a significant R&D element in that because that is less mobile than just manufacturing and services. And I can see this increasing uh, in the future. and I think it is the future. Uh, of course, all of this, um, high quality graduates, valuable intellectual property, is only possible if the research base is strong and of the highest quality. And of course, if investment in it continues. That's the only word I'll say about investment. But you don't get it for free. Quality is not cheap, uh, even though we have, to, we have to be smart in getting the best quality with the minimum resources. But it does cost. Um, and of course, our approach will not work either unless the whole system, this whole country, actually is rewired to be innovation friendly, to be friendly towards new ideas, to encourage people to commercialize new ideas. And that is a task that the, uh, is, is just being taken up by the Innovation Task Force, uh, headed by Dermot McCarthy at the highest level of government, uh, to, to create that whole ecosystem in the country. And that is redesigning the country. That is recreating the new, the new country. And I would say then re research and education is part of that ecosystem. We're not, we're not the answer to everything, let me assure you, but we are a powerful element in this, I would say, new ecosystem. So the model that I've just spelled out um, is, uh, I would say, at odds with uh, the McCarthy Report, uh, which, as I read it, views universities as they were 20 years ago, largely undergraduate in nature. But it is a model that's consistent with government policy, with the smart economy. It is consistent with the OECD, OECD view of the world and OECD's view of Ireland, with the EU's view of the world. And it is consistent with uh, US President Obama's view of the role of American universities, which he very clearly stated, uh, and which featured very strongly in his stimulus package. That is our competition. So in our alliance with UCD, we have stepped out of the box. This is new. We are taking a risk, but why not? And uh, the question I would ask is, is there an alternative in this country to new knowledge and skills? I would say not. And I would say that reversal of investment in research and higher graduate education will, in my view, effectively suggest that Ireland is closed for business. And I don't think we want to go down that route. Now, I want to go on to a, a different example, uh, and it is, um, it is about the curriculum itself. Now, I'm not actually talking about doing something new. I'm talking about um, ensuring that we hold on to something that has worked very well for us in the past. So let me give you the, the example. Two weeks ago, uh, in Trinity, uh, we ordered a, awarded a honorary degree to Janet Brown, who is, professor, is now a professor at Harvard and a graduate of zoology uh, from Trinity. Trinity. She's the foremost biographer of Darwin. And remember, this is the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. I asked her how she moved from being a zoologist to being a historian, a historian of science. And she put it down to a few lectures 
in our fourth year as a student by David Webb, who was professor of botany at the time, uh, he's now deceased, on the history of science and its role in the development of culture and civilization. She said that up to then, she had no idea that science had a history and what a life-transforming experience that was for her. Now, why did Professor Webb give those lectures? It wasn't in the curriculum. It wasn't down there in the calendar that says, this is what you're going to get if you join this course. He did it because he was intensely interested in all fields and the, co the connectedness between them and that sh students should also be likewise. It was spontaneous, yet it was likely the result of months of private, unfettered scholarship and reflection on his part. Time for reflection, that's what I want to, what I want to mention here. I would say today such spontaneity could be frowned upon, it could be difficult um, given the um, force for greater compliance, greater bureaucratic reporting, uh, the pressure to follow a preset curriculum without any deviation. And I would say that these taken too far are the enemies of creativity and the magic of the unexpected. So I would say that, yes, universities should be held to the highest standards of accountability, but please simplify compliance and regulation before it chokes us all with expense and procedures. Let's be innovative as a country in that regard also. The next example um, is in the humanities. Uh, and again, in Trinity, we are embarked on, I would say, I, I, I believe, a very special groundbreaking project to unleash the power of the 18th century long room library where the Book of Kells uh, is, using technology and digitization to make it available for the whole world. And our plan would be, is to define Ireland as an international hub of scholarship in the humanities in advancing the understanding of what it means to be human, of the, of the, of the human condition, drawing on resources like these. Now, one sp specific project I think is extremely interesting. In 1641, uh, the outbreak of a rebellion by the Catholic Irish is alleged to have begun with the general massacre of Protestant settlers. This allegation has been the cause of much bitter historical controversy ever since. The 1641 depositions are the witness testimonies of the Protestant settlers, men and women, gathered by government appointed commissioners after that rising. All 19,000 pages of, 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 uh, of those depositions are sitting in the Trinity Library, largely untouched for, uh, since 1741. That's, they've been sitting there since then. Now our goal is to digitize these testimonies and make them, make them available to scholars all over the world for analysis. Now, IBM is intensely involved with this project. Now, why is IBM involved with that, might, I might ask? Well, the reason is the documents are difficult. They're handwritten, very little grammatical structure, and the same word in the same page can be spelt differently. So the most advanced technology, digitizing technology, artificial intelligence, all that kind of stuff, cannot deal with that kind of information. It's too complex, it's too non-standard. The brain can deal with it. The brain is extremely good at that. And that is what's happening at the moment with students and postdocs and so on. IBM would like to capture that mental process, understand it first and capture it in new technology and then have, be able to uh, have technology that can deal with non-standard information like this. So I think here is an interesting situation. You might not predict it. The humanities and human curiosity having the ability to transform technology. Now, it's not a new one for the books. And my point is that breakthroughs can come from the most unlikely quarters in which curiosity plays a big part. We shouldn't forget the drive for curiosity, the human condition. So the humanities meeting the technologies can spark the most extraordinary developments and it's ripe for all of that to happen. And we should cater to that. We should encourage it and I certainly intend to. Now the next example is in the sciences and I think demonstrates how science, intellectual property, new business, student inspiration can all work together, not in conflict, but together. Last year, a new company, Opsona Therapeutics, was launched by three of our professors immunologists, um, 
and they uh, uh, their six-year research uh, program on un understanding the immune system produced a family of potential anti-inflammatory drugs dealing with diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, MS, and irritable bowel disease. Now, the founders have published their papers in the best international journals. Uh, they've patented their ideas. They've raised over 30 million venture capital funding for their company already. And through their research at deals with Wyatt and Merck, Shearing Plow, they are chasing for a $450 billion market. And their next plan is to raise 300 million more venture capital. This is the biggest company that has come out of the life sciences, out of, this, out of, out of, the, out of higher education in this country. So far, it could be the next biggest, uh, the next big international biotechnology company. Now, there are a few interesting features about this which I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, the company is the product of the highest quality research by world-class academics funded by Science Foundation Ireland in this country. The research has targeted fundamental issues, not trivial issues, the most fundamental issues, understanding disease and the immune system. And secondly, they're training the next generation of researchers who will set up their companies or be hired by companies like Opsoma. Thirdly, the researchers are some of our best and most inspiring teachers. All you have to do is ask the students. And, and, and finally, the, these researchers have engaged with the public in the understanding of their science. They have put on an exhibition in the Science Gallery specifically for the second level students and young adults. And over a three month period, this drew 40,000 40, visitors. Now, here's a case I think which combines almost everything seamlessly, brilliant academics, reaching out to the second level and the public, inspiring our undergraduates, making breakthrough discoveries in research, creating a new business, and training the people who will do, who will do likewise. Here there is no tension between teaching and research, between academia and business, between science and the public, or between the second, third, or fourth levels. My job is to clear the way for people like them and to duplicate it as much as possible, as frequently as possible, across the whole uh, university and across the whole country, if possible. And the point I'm making is that knowledge transfer is really the third arm of the university. It arises naturally from good teaching and research. The three reinforce each other. They're not in conflict. And finally, the, uh, and, and, uh, 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 other point I'd make is that success does not happen overnight. It took these people six years of research to produce Opsona, but the impact on teaching was immediate. So what I'm saying is you cannot disaggregate these various parts. If you do something to teaching, you damage research. If you do something to research, you damage teaching. It's all of a, it's of a whole. In a way, this is the new paradigm, I would think, of the university. So we need to be careful how we tackle it or how we want to reform it. The final uh, example, if I I'll take uh, just two minutes, um, is, relates to access to education, something of, of great importance. Every third level institution has its own program to reach out to those who are disadvantaged in our society, and that is absolutely important. I while this is happening, I think we must be aware that probably the best way to address disadvantage is at the preschool and primary level. And I think we must also be conscious that in this recession, there are thousands of people of all ages losing their jobs, and many of these would be looking for further education, reskilling, upskilling. And higher education has to respond to all of that, and I think it will. However, I'd like to focus on one special area of dis disadvantage, just as an illustration of, of uh, innovation. Uh, about a decade, a decade ago, a number of enthusiasts uh, in Trinity, along with some involved parents, set up a pilot scheme for those who suffer intellectual disability, such as Down syndrome. The goal was to develop within the university a program of education that might transform the lives of these special people and to develop, through research, best practice in this area. Today, we have a National Institute for Intellectual Disability funded by the HEA 
and funded by private sources. The impact has been extraordinary. Rather than talking about the impact, let me, let it, I'd like to let it speak for itself because one of the graduates of a program this, uh, uh, on contemporary living, um, Helen Donnelly, who suffers from intellectual disability, uh, wrote a poem. I'd like to read the poem, very short. It's, she said, as one door closes after me, I open a door to the future, full of challenges and experiences, bravery, determination. The next door I open is a bumpy road ahead, and it becomes steeper and harder to walk. Until I reach the top, then I come down followed by a smooth path along the way. Isn't that wonderful? We're very proud of her. She could well be talking about the difficulties and challenges that are facing this country today, and I hope that we as a country will meet those challenges as successfully as she met hers. So the point I want to make here is that the need to, to question assumptions about the capacity of human beings and to broaden the concept of who benefits from education. I think it is innovation in action. So just a final word. Um, you know, community. I, I did say that university is not a business. It is a community. We tend to forget that. It is not just about, and it's not a knowledge factory. Uh, as in the monasteries which preceded the concept of the university, community life involves reflection as well as action, time for reflection, in which everyone learns by being challenged inside and outside the lecture theater, in which the qualities of wisdom, leadership, and civic engagement are honed, in which knowledge is advanced and made to work for the benefit of society, in which teaching, research, and innovation are partners, in which there is engagement with enterprise, the public and government, and which the only benchmark is quality, and finally, in which there is an expectation of delivery of something special and unique to society that is beyond the ordinary. The university has a responsibility to do something that no other organization in the country can do, and that is the challenge. It's a wonderful challenge. I think it's a challenge that's particularly true today. So I'd like to leave with that, and I hope you. Thank you.